Hi, I'm Mark from the Microtasker Project. In this video, I'm going to discuss and also do some demonstrations of the Microtasker bootloader concept. For the demonstrations themselves, I'm going to be using this IMX RT1060 board. But we start with why do we need a bootloader? Well, Bootloading is something which tends to be thought of once developments are essentially completed, a bit of an afterthought. But in the Microtasker project, this is a fundamental, basic functionality that every project should really have. Therefore, it's there on day one. Now, the idea of behind bootloading is not just to get the software up and running, but also to allow new software to be programmed once the product has been delivered. Some other very important parts of the bootloader concept are IP protection and cloning protection. That means how do you ensure that all of the investment you've made into the development of your software is not simply copied by somebody by reverse engineering the code you put in your product? And how do you ensure that another company doesn't just take your hardware, make a copy of it, take your software, program it into their device and sell it as a counterfeit? And third and final general point, how do we keep this as simple as possible so that developers don't have a steep learning curve and can simply, immediately and efficiently start using it? In this diagram, we see an IMXRT part connected via Flex SPI to an external QSPI flash memory. In this example, we're assuming a 4 megabyte part. The processor always boots up from the start of the external QSPI memory. And at this location, we install the bare minimum bootloader from the Microtasker project together with what we call a fallback serial loader. These two pieces of software always operate together and they are installed as a single file. A typical name for this single file is Microtasker Bootloader Image.bin. The bare minimum bootloader is stored in a plain code form without any encryption. The fallback serial loader is, however, encrypted using AES256. The fallback loader gives us the opportunity to install further software. The next piece of software will be the serial loader, which is used by the project itself. Again, it's stored in AES256 encrypted form. The serial loader which we've installed here may be very similar to the fallback serial loader, but this one can be updated in the field if required. The fallback serial loader itself is there to always offer the recovery of the board if ever needed. Here we see the typical name of the binary which is uploaded. This now represents the Microtasker boot loaders. Using the serial loader which we've installed here, we can now install also applications. The application would generally also be stored in AES256 encrypted form. A typical name is here. The remaining area in the QSBI flash can then be used for file systems, parameter systems, and even for making backups of application software in the field. So what we can already see is the, the majority of the software here is already stored in an encrypted form. That means that it is not possible to reverse engineer the software which we find here. However, there is a weakness at the moment in the bare minimum bootloader itself because the bare minimum bootloader is stored as plain text and also includes the AES256 private key which is used for decrypting the software when it runs. So now I'm going to explain how we get around this potential weakness. What we find in the bare minimum bootloader is that we have these AES256 keys which we need to somehow make private. So what we do is we make use of the security modules within the IMX RT parts. The ones of interest are shown here. The method that we use is the following. When the bootloader operates for the very first time, that means it only needs to happen once and it doesn't need any user support to get this to work. First of all, we use the true random number generator to generate a random number which is stored in the eFuses area. 
specifically in a register called SWGP2. Now this register is then protected so it can neither be read out by the ISP via the uh, JTAG or the secure JTAG and also not by the processor core. That means that the value which is stored in here which is a totally random number and presumably unique for every piece of hardware we produce cannot be read. However, it can be used by the bus encryption engine as it's AES125 key. So the method that we use is the very first time when it started and we've just planted this random number into the eFuse area is that we use the BEE's AES128 encryption engine to read in the complete code that we've loaded here. That will then generate us a secret number which is known only to this module which can then be used to secure the plain text AES256 keys. That means that we can then destroy the original keys which could otherwise have been read by almost anybody and then we store them in its encrypted form in this area of the memory. Now only this particular chip based on this unknown AES128 key can ever decrypt that. So that brings us back to another requirement that we wanted that is clone protection. That means that once this software has run the first time so that it, it generates its own secret AES128 key for the BEE module this software can only ever be used by this single processor. That means that even if I take off this SBI chip from the board and try to get it to run on a different processor, it will not be able to run. That means we have IP protection, we have cloning protection, we have simplicity because the user didn't have to do any work himself or herself. So following this introduction to the microtask bootloading concept on the IMX RT, we're going to get more practical and we're going to take this board and we're going to load it and see what happens. Now if you're new to this, the very first thing we need to know about is setting the dip switches so that we can program the board. Now the dip switches on this board are located here. And what I need to do is to set it so that it starts up in the ISP mode the in-circuit programming mode. Now to do that, I set the first switch into the on position and the second one into the off position. And I now connect my PC via USB to the debug connection, which also powers the board. Now what you see here is that the board appears as an external hard drive. This is the debugger on the board doing that. So this now allows me to program the first binary to the board, which is a combined binary containing the Microtasker bare minimum bootloader plus the AES256 encrypted fallback loader. This is a file I'm going to load. So by doing drag and drop, don't worry that this takes a certain amount of time because what it's doing is it's deleting the complete flash on the board, which takes uh, about 10 to 15 seconds. But once it's ready, then it will copy this file. Now I want to use a second tool. Now to, before I can use the second tool, I have to connect the PC again to USB, but this time to a USB device socket, which is the processors and not the debuggers. Now this second tool is from NXP and it's called NXP MCU Boot Utility version 2.2, the one that I have. I've set this up for connecting to the device, the 1062 in fact on this board, and now I can connect to it. This is a very useful utility for programming and also observing the content of the uh, QSPI flash. And what I'm going to do is I'm just going to read back the first 16 kilobytes. Now there are two um, things which I want to note. The first one is, if we look at the end of this 16 kilobytes, it's full of FFs, which means it's an unprogrammed area. I'm going to go back to the um, start of this file and then move 
onto a location which I'm looking for, which is just here. This is a location where the AES256 secret keys which we talked about are stored. We can see here that um, they are strings in this case and very easy to read. So obviously, although we have AES256 encryption being used for all of the loaded programs, just by using this tool, I could have found that key and broken the system. So now I'm going to disconnect from the device and we're going to start working with the software we've loaded on the board. Before we can do that, I have to set the dip switches back to their original settings so that the software will start rather than the in-circuit programming, which means that I set the switches back to how they used to be. And now I can make a reset and we can see the microtask bootloader, um, the, the fallback loader in operation. Here we can see that when it works, we have an LED which is blinking at this rate. On my TerraTerm interface, here we can see that the fallback loader is running. And secondly, that the fallback loader has um, appeared as an external hard drive, which is called fallback LD for easy recognition. What I'm doing now is switching the switches back into the ISP mode. And we're going to get back into that mode. The reason why I'm doing that is because the bootloader has run once. And if you remember, that means that it should have encrypted uh, these um, secret keys, which we didn't want to be able to see in the flash. So reconnecting to the boot utility, I can now read the contents again. And what we now see at the end of this 16 kilobyte block there's a bunch of um, binary values which uh, hopefully don't mean anything to us because they are the encrypted version of our initial AES256 private keys. And if I go back to the location we looked at before where we could see them in plain text form, what we will hopefully now see is that they are no longer there. They have been wiped out. Now that our bootloader has installed its encrypted AES256 key, it can be safely used to decrypt any applications that we load. So now I'm ready to load my serial loader. This is the binary which I've got ready. And I'm going to drag this onto the fallback disk. It takes just a few seconds. And now that we've seen that we've moved from our fallback loader, up to the serial loader itself. Now the serial loader which I just installed I'd configured to allow me to load in different ways. One way is using the same technique, a USB MSD device. Here we can see that it's appeared as an upload disk or I can load it over the UART as an S record and the third possibility that I've configured for this one is that I can also insert a memory stick and it will load the code from there. What I'm showing here is just one diagram out of the Microtasker Serial Loader User's Guide, which gives some information about the types of loader that are supported. Just very briefly, you can see that it supports device, USB device type loaders, including MSD, uh, so that the board looks like an external memory um, drive, a very, very popular method of doing it. It also supports the K-Boot protocol. We can also use USB host mode, which allows the connecting a memory stick, which will then load the code. We can also use SD card loading. We can use also UART loading. We can use some forms of Ethernet loading. And we can also use I2C loading. It's worth also pointing out here that we also support Modbus slave. That means that we can also act as a Modbus slave either over the UART or over TCP to accept new software. Now, seeing that we've already seen the USB MSD device loading in operation when we loaded the serial loader, this time I'm going to use the host loading mode. Here's my memory stick where I've loaded an application I'd like to be loaded. And now I'm going to plug it in and we're going to see what happens. 
Now here we see that it's detected the memory stick, it's checked the software, it's uploaded it, and now we've got the application already operating. So let me now show you how I can move between these loaders, all controlled by the application. In my administration menu, I can command a boot, which means it will put me back into the serial loader. Here the serial loader has still found the memory stick, it's checked that the software is up to date, and we've started the application again. I've got the power to also command the fallback bootloader. This is the fallback bootloader operating. It has a small timeout, so if I don't do anything, it will stop. It will then load the serial loader again, and then the serial loader loads the application. Of course, at any point there, I could have stopped it uploaded a new serial loader or uploaded a new application. So the final thing I'd like to show is over the air software updating. This board has got an ethernet connection and the application that I've loaded supports this on a web server which will allow me to upload new code. So here I've browsed the board's IP address and I have various web pages. For example, I could set up the IP of the board. If I go to the administration page, I have the possibility to do firmware updates. Before I do that, I'm going back to the first side so that we can see the software version which is presently loaded. Now we go to the administration page again and we choose a new software which I've just built which has a different software version. It actually is called test version. So I choose the, the software which I want to upload, press the upload button. The upload is very fast and after a few seconds it reloads and this time we see that the new version 1.4 test is active. Many thanks for watching this video which has discussed the bootloader concept in the Microtasker project for IMXRT. The next video that I'll be producing will show how very simple it is to build the projects using MCU Expresso, IAR or just from a GCC BAT file.